Amen. So this is the heart of today. As Jesus said, if you want a life that is enduring, a community that is enduring, you built it upon the foundations of his teachings, of his truth. And when we grew up, when I grew up uh, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, I think society and the schools in which we were really close to some of the biblical norms, not all of it. We had other issues back then. And uh, just in conversations with parents around us, and parents in the church, in the school, and looking at the media, we find ourselves really concerned about the, the well-being of the identity of my child. What does he believe is normative? Because in the past, I would send my kid to school, and, and just when it comes to general ideas of sexuality and sex and identity, my kids would be fine. Uh, relatively, the school would generally, when I grew up, teach the same things that I would teach in church or what we teach in home. But things have changed, and uh, this is not the same anymore. So today is really about empowering teachers and empowering parents, but how do I teach my kids? How do I build resilience and biblical faith when it comes to identity, sexuality, in their, in their mindset, in their home? What are the practices? What are the things? So uh, I was so blessed when I saw my friend Nicola de Ocher and um, Ryan Smith at a, a few weeks ago in Course for Justice, a few months ago, at a teaching. Um, session, and I also, that's where I met for the first time uh, Reitzer Rodseth, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't meet him, I just saw him on TV, so he's one of those people, people when I meet him, say that I've, I know you from TV, <laughs> I know from TV. <laughs> so um, he asked that he will introduce himself in, in terms of why he comes here, he's a medical professional uh, with a background in, in anesthesiology, that's right, no, narcosa, and um, Thank you for flying down. Thank you. I know that you had a few meetings with Ryan and with Nicola, but thank you for flying down. And thank you for coming to make this time to speak to us about gender, identity, and sexuality. I really appreciate it. Let's put our hands together. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Um, thank you for the opportunity to meet you with us. I'm actually English, but my wife is Afrikaans. So, Afrikaans is the tale of love. Yes. But I can sock you in all the good things. But as I come to the technical good things, I'm going to go over to English. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you on this topic, as Ross has said, of identity, specifically gender identity. I am an anesthetist and not criticier. I mean, sometimes when I talk to people, they start to get a little bit sleepy. <laughs> so as you know, if, as you know, find iemand raak so in die slaap, gee my so a shot. This is my family. Um, that's Miranda, my wife. She's a radiologist. My two boys, Joshua and Nathan. That's the posed photo. This is what it looks like in real life. I don't normally, my wife still doesn't know that I show this photo. <laughs> so I'm an Medical doctor, studied at, U at Pretoria University, specialized in anesthesia, subspecialized in critical care. I've got a master's degrees in anesthesia and a PhD in anesthesia, and then a master's degrees in health research methodology, which evaluates the quality of research, how we get it, how good it is, how we can apply it. I'm also busy with a master's in Christian apologetics and philosophy um, at SES University. My research experience <clears throat> is focused, a significant component of it, on the quality of research. How do we know something is good? Can we trust it? And I speak about a lot of the issues from this framework. And it's a, sort of the position in which I'm going to be talking to you about. I'm also associated with the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, which I can recommend to you. The legal stuff, <clears throat> I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a child psychiatrist, I don't practice child psychiatry, I'm not treating anybody with gender dysphoria. This is not clinical advice and shouldn't be taken as such, and I'm speaking on my own recognizance, not as a representative of any organization. You know why I need to do this. <laughs> I like minions. <laughs> Got to think about it. All right. What is truth? Anybody? in Anyone? What is, what is evaluate? What is truth? Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? It's like one of these eternal questions. 
So, to say of what is that it is not, or to say of what is not that it is, that is false. Reitzer has a full bush of thick, luscious hair. It is not. That's false. Me? See, you're going, yeah. <laughs> to say of what is that it is, or to say what is not, that it is not. There is a lectern here. There is not a unicorn here. That is truth. What is it? What am I talking about? That which is true is what is real. Truth corresponds to reality. That is the core, that is the heart of truth. It is also what Jesus says. This ridiculous statement. I am the way... I am the truth, I am the life. He's saying that he is the real. Hey, is what var is, hey, is what is. Strangely enough, that's what God says, I am what I am. Now, what is love? How's that for a question? Hey? Yeah. <laughs> Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> True love is setting your will to consistently seek the true good of the other. Love is consistently setting your will. It's a decision that you make. It's not an emotion. It's a thoughtful, conscious decision. It's setting your will to seek the true good of the other, which obviously leads you to ask the next question is, what is the true good of the other? What is the true good of the other? What's this? No, it's a picture of a hammer. Yeah. It's a hammer. What is its purpose? To hammer. Very good. It's not that difficult. Purpose of a hammer is to hit a nail or something, to hammer stuff in. That's its purpose. What is a good hammer? <laughs> That's a, good oper that's a good operator. A good hammer is a hammer that hammers well, right? It fulfills its purpose because it's a hammer. What is a bad hammer? This is a bad hammer. It's going to be difficult to hammer with a hammer. How can you use a hammer well? You use it for the purpose with which it was designed. So you hammer stuff with it. You don't open bottles of wine with it. You can, it's messy, it doesn't work so well. Here's a little thing that children do. What is it and what is it for? It's a paintbrush, it's for painting, it's a car, it's for driving, it's an umbrella, it's for keeping the wind off you. It's a ladybug, it's for looking at and going, wow. <laughs> to know the good, you must know what something is what its nature is. What is, the, what is this thing? So that leads us to the question, what is a human being? What are we? What are we? Once we know what we are, we know what it is good, and we know what a good use, we don't use us, but what our use, our purpose becomes. All right? Let's just step it back for a second. What is, an, what is God? What is the nature of God? Now, if we look at God, God is almighty, all-wise, all-powerful. He exists in a state that is perfect, that is perfectly good. He makes perfect decisions all the time. He is, in His very nature, goodness. This is what God is, who He is. He's the most perfect, the most pure, the most wonderful, the most po powerful, the most holy God. That is His nature, that is His character, that's, his, that's like the essence of who He is. But he's a God of relationships. How do we know that? Uniquely, in all religions, God is Trinitarian. He's in constant relationship with the persons in the Trinity. In love, in this just amazing one relationship. And he creates us, mankind, human beings, to be in relationship with him and with one another. And he calls us to be holy. He says, be like, I, be like I am, be holy 
in our relationships, in our being, in our living. We are called to reflect God's holiness, His purity, the goodness. And the instructions that we get from God allow us to thrive and to grow and to prosper. When you follow His instructions for use according to your nature, then you have the opportunity to know Him, to grow with Him, to grow in community, to experience fullness in life. So what is a good human being? Give me lists of what is a good human? Yeah? Kindness? Love? Purity? Honesty? Generosity? Compassion? Hardworking? Any culture you ask, this is the list that you get. Okay? We know these things to be good of, that's the nature of good human. This is what it is. Good human actions, to love somebody. This is the doing, caring for somebody, sacrificing, working hard, not working too hard. What are good things to do with your body? Eat, but not to excess. Drink, but not alcohol and to excess. You drink medication, but don't use drugs. Exercise, do it, not too much. Sex, yes, in his confines. So, true love is setting your will to consistently seek the true good of the other, right? We know what a human is. I've given you an outline. It comes from God. It's relational. It reflects God in purity and in purpose, we know what the concepts are of. So this is true love, is to set your will to seek the true good of the other. And God showed that by setting His will to send Jesus to die for us because that was in our best interest, for our good. That is love. That is what He did. That's how it translates out. And so there's then ultimately loving to speak the truth to somebody, to tell them the truth and to do that in a loving way, that is love. It starts off with what is true, and then it's loving to tell people what the truth is. So to tell your son who can't hold a single note that he is the greatest thing in the world is not loving at all. To tell my daughter or a daughter that she can dance and sing, but she's got no skill in that is not loving. To give a child Anything they want, whenever they ask for it, is not loving. To not teach them discipline, sacrifice, is not loving. To show them truth is loving. So with that, I want to say that a man cannot become a woman. A trans woman remains a biological man. A woman cannot become a man. A trans man remains a biological woman. Gender is not a social construct. It is bound to biology. Gender is not fluid. Words are not disagreement. And, violent, and uh, disagreement is not hate. That is truth because that what is reflected in reality. It's anchored in Jesus and it is loving to say that because this speaks to the nature of what we are. Right, we huddled. When we talk about the transgender issue in South Africa, in general, when we talk about the transgender issue, people get really confused because there's so many different categories and they blur it and there's a lot of talking, a lot of heat, very little light. In South Africa, when we start talking about the transgender issue, the first thing that people think about is Castor Semenya. Castor Semenya is not a trans individual. So I'm going to try and give you four categories on which to hang your discussion so that you can think clearly about it, but also so that when you engage in discussion with your colleagues and friends and just in general, you have some information to talk clearly and thoughtfully and can show some truth and some love when you do it. So let's start off with Castor Semenya. Castor Semenya has got a condition called intersex, today called disorders of sexual development. So this means, well, let's take a second. When we talk about sex, it's very basic. Don't let any uh, 
body from the social sciences try to tell you that it's not. You get a male who produces sperm, this is in mammals, and a female who produces eggs. The egg and the sperm get together. It creates a new life, a totally unique DNA pattern, something that has never existed before. It starts living from the moment of fertilization. That is reproductive function. That is the basis of sex. Finished. Like every biology textbook in the world does this. You need to go to university to be persuaded that it's different. <laughs> it comes in two functions. Women and, and humans have got XX chromosomes. That's the sex chromosomes. And men, XY. Now, when you inherit your chromosomes from your parents, you can have a problem with inheritance. We live in a broken world. Down syndrome is an example of you inheriting an abnormality on your chromosomes so that they've got an extra chromosome, which leads to a clinical picture. In the same way, you can inherit genetic, uh, a problem in your genetic material around your sex chromosomes, right? So it's an intersex condition, or it's a disorder of sexual development, and it's linked genetically. What is that? So you can inherit, you're a female, but you only get one X chromosome. So you've got a thing called Turner's syndrome. It's described by Turner, that's why it's got his name. You're female, you look female, but you're different. You've got a shield-shaped chest, wide carrying angle, generally short, shorter stature, infertility. You do the test, you've got XO syndrome, you've got Turner syndrome. You can inherit an extra X chromosome. You've got trisomy, tri means three, trisomy um, X syndrome, three. You can be a man, XY, and have an additional X chromosome. Now you've got Kleinefelter syndrome. Like Down syndrome, or like the genetic problems that you have inherited from your parents, or me, the balding thing. You can have normal genetics, but as your body tries to manufacture sex hormones or respond to the sex hormones, there's a problem in how it responds. So this is hormonal DSD. As an example, I can be born with genetically XY, so I'm a man, but I've got androgen insensitivity syndrome or 5-alpha reductase deficiency means I don't make testosterone or my body doesn't respond to testosterone. So if you are in utero and busy growing and you don't have testosterone, your body develops to look like a female. So the child is born, you look at the child, she's female. Call her Sally, she goes to school, she gets raised as a, as a girl, she goes through puberty, because she's got testes, she starts to produce testosterone, more testosterone. Sometimes this is a partial response. Her genetic script is one of male, so she's taller, she starts to get exposed to more testosterone, starts to get slightly more masculine features, a little bit of an Adam's apple, taller, wider shoulders, more muscle. When you run, you run faster, so you win at the inter-school, you win at the local championships, you win at the, at the regionals, you get selected for the national team, you run internationally, they test your blood levels for testosterone, for doping as standard, and lo and behold, your testosterone levels are way above what a woman normally has, and this whole thing, oh, you're intersex. This condition is very, very well known and understood in the sporting world because of what I've just described to you. When you run in this condition against other genetic women, you do exceptionally well because you have high levels of testosterone and you've been exposed to them all along. Got it. Where's the sin? What I mean by that is, what's going on here? We always want to know where's the sin? What, what's wrong? Is there something wrong with this condition? So as a framework, I'm going to use John chapter 9. There's a man born blind. And the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned that he should be born blind? Is it him or was his family? And Jesus says, nobody sinned. He was born this way that God would be glorified for through him. God gives us these conditions, this fallenness, so that he may be glorified through us, through our weaknesses. When he redeems it, the glory goes to him. So Castor, or somebody born with an intersex condition, have they sinned? No. They've been born with an intersex condition in the same way that somebody with Down syndrome has. They've not taken a choice. They've been raised in a specific way. It is just their genetic condition. Okay? 
DSDs. Got it. Op pad. Het is vroeg in die ochtend, nee? All right, second category. This is a condition called persistent gender dysphoria. And to help you remember, the picture I'm showing you is of Bruce Jenner. He's a man, was an Olympic athlete, gold medal decathlete for the USA, who then transitioned to become Caitlyn Jenner, this voluptuous, um, in some ways a caricature of what a woman is, and was nominated as Woman of the Year in 2017 on Vogue. So let's talk quickly about gender and definitions. Women have feminine characteristics, and men have got masculine characteristics. When you think of that, you immediately know what I mean. I can't necessarily show you one individual that has all of it, but in the same way if I say, you know what a dog looks like, and you say, yeah, describe a dog to me, it's got four legs, it's got floppy ears, and it's got hair. So I show you a dog that doesn't have four legs, is that still a dog? It's still a dog. We're able to extract from the group what we understand by that. We know what it is. In South Africa, we've got masculine characteristics that are based on my biology. The basis for this is my biology, and there's an expression of that. How does the average South African male dress? I'm in the uniform, yeah? You know, I'm in this shirt, I've got the chinos, I've got the cats. It's just, that's it. If I was wearing a dress, so you would, everybody would be, all of you are smiling slightly. Is he gonna pull out a dress now? You would feel uncomfortable because it breaks the social norm. Men don't wear dresses in South Africa in this scenario. In Scotland, men wear kilts. If I was in Scotland and it was a traditional function and I was wearing a kilt, it would be acceptable because men culturally can dress like that. It is an appropriate gender expression for your biological sex. So it varies based on cultural expectation, but it is grounded in biology. The lie in the media and taught in the universities is that gender is fully divorced from biology. It is fully a social construct. And that's a purposeful statement that's being made. It's being driven because of the, all the philosophy that underpins some of the stuff that um, uh, Nicola will be talking about. It's like trying to divorce waves from the ocean. It's trying to divorce gender from sex, biological sex. Gender identity is how I feel about who I am. I feel male, I feel female, I feel neither, I feel both. Gender is expression is how I express that outside. So it's the behavior, the mannerisms, the appearance, the stuff that I'm doing to you that signals that I'm a man. If I came here dressed as a woman, I would be trying to express a female gender to you. Maybe I was trying to mix them, say I'm both or neither of them. But we always use the categories of male and female. You cannot escape it. It's just, it is always there. So Bruce Jenner's got persistent gender dysphoria. This is a well-understood, well-described medical condition in which people have got an ongoing deep unease, dysphoria about their gender. So I'm a man, but I feel like that's the wrong gender. It doesn't feel right. I always, I, maybe if I'm a woman, I want to be a woman, this feeling of discomfort will go away. And it's not just a little discomfort. It's a massive, deep, consistent dysphoria. Life is wrong. Life is not nice. I'm struggling with them. I struggle to hold a job. I've got depression. I've got anxiety. High suicide rates. This is a huge burden. And people with this disease will come to a psychiatrist and say, help me. Like my life is falling apart, I need help with it. So when you talk to them, they'll tell you that they consistently, insistently, and persistently will remember being like this from when they were small. It just didn't fit into these categories. It was always wrong. It's like an itch in your mind. It won't go away. How common is it? In men, it's more common, 1 in 20,000 to 3 in 20,000, and less common in women, 1 in 50,000 to 1 in 30,000. So you would need 100 high schools of 500 each. You have a school with 500. You need 100 high schools to have one girl. And now you've got three girls presenting with gender dysphoria in one high school of 500. What's going on? This is the history of gender dysphoria, the, what I call almost like the classic presentation. And 
well described in the medical literature, well, fairly well understood. High rates of suicide, of suicide, depression, anxiety. This is a serious debilitating condition meant to be taken seriously, difficult to treat. So what do you do? So the, the people present to the, to the psychiatrist asking for help, trying to engage in therapy, trying to work them through, how can we help you alleviate the anxiety? If you want to be a woman, and this is causing the anxiety, why don't you dress as a woman? Does that help relieve your anxiety? Okay, maybe. What about we now give you medical therapy to make you look estrogen to make you look more like a woman? What about surgery to make you look more like a woman? So we do a breast implant for you, maybe shave off some of the parts of the chin. Can we make you look more like a woman so that when in the society you can pass as a woman? Does that help? The best studies that we have over the longest period of time show that in the, at about 15 to 20 years, 10 to 15 years, the outcomes on those people are not better. The suicide rates remain high, 40 times normal, high incidence of uh, depression, high incidence of anxiety. It doesn't seem to work. It does seem to work maybe for the first two to three to four years. But then after five or six years, it doesn't seem to achieve the end. So the guy said, well, one of the problems is that if I try to pass as a woman, it's pretty obvious that I'm a guy. I put on a wig, I put on some lipstick, I put on a shirt with, you know, boobs, and I put on my high heels, and guys go, like, people go, oh, that's a guy dressing as a girl. Because I look in my body like a girl, a man. So maybe you can stop my development earlier, before I hit puberty. Let's stop me from developing my height, my width, my facial features. Let's keep, put me on puberty blockers, block my testosterone. Do that as I'm entering into, into puberty. At around 16 years, start giving me estrogen so that I start to develop breasts, softening of the face. At around 18 years, have surgery. This is based on what's called the Dutch protocol, which has now been incorporated into one of the WPATH guidelines. Um, they are not standards of care. They're just sort of a, a broad consensus among certain people on how we think we should treat these people. Does this work? We don't know. This stuff is so new that we don't have long-term outcome data from this. It is so rare, was so rare, that we don't have enough studies in which to do it. Some of the original work from which the Dutch did is based on 33 patients. They've been followed for about 10, sorry, like five to six years. We don't know what the long-term outcome. What does seem to happen is that in the beginning, again, there's an improvement in the sense of well-being, a reduction in the dysphoria, similarly to what we were seeing in the, in the traditional treatment patterns. What's a Christian response to somebody with persistent gender dysphoria? They are born with this cross, with this wrinkle in the mind that's causing them this dysphoria. How are we to respond to them? And I again point to that part of John Rabbi, who sinned that this man should have this cross to bear. Depression, schizophrenia, body dysmorphic disorder, where I've got issues, psychological issues with how I see my body. My answer there is that this is an inherited or a received condition, a state of being. They haven't chosen to feel this way. So to have the dysphoria is not a sin. The question is, how do you respond to that dysphoria? What, how do you act it out? What do you do to alleviate this thing? So what I've done is looked at trans people who were trans, then became Christians. What do they do? So they say, they talk about finding their identity in Christ. I am no longer a trans person. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. The center core of my identity is not my dysphoria. It doesn't define me. I am first a Christian. The dysphoria is something that I carry with me. They'll talk about their cross. Same as people struggle with pedophilia, same-sex attraction, pornography. That is something that we all have to sit with, some type of cross that we all have to bear. What do they do? They stop hormonal therapy. They stop dressing 
expressing across gender identity. If they've had surgery, most of them don't have surgery again because of the invasiveness of the, na of the nature of the surgery. But they return to the expression of their biological sex. What is a Christian who is suffering with gender dysphoria to do? Your body is sacred. Humans are this body and the soul together. We've been given it by God. I told you about its nature. That's what it lies at the core of it. Jesus gave great honor to the human body in that he became flesh incarnate. And we are not to distort that which is healthy and, and well made. There's nothing wrong with a person with body, gen, uh, gender dysphoria. There's nothing wrong with their body. Find your identity in Jesus. Your identity is not your dysphoria. Just like in your sexual attraction is not your identity. You are not a gay person. You are a Christian. Just like my academic success is not my identity. That used to be my identity. My identity is in Jesus Christ. Don't have the hormonal therapy. Don't undergo the sex change surgery. That is not the way from a Christian perspective to deal with it. But also medically, the evidence is not supportive that that is the way to do it. It's going to give you freedom from the dysphoria. How do you engage with somebody with gender dysphoria? The gender dysphoria is not their problem. My alcoholism is not the problem. There is one problem. Do you know Jesus? That's the key thing. You build true relationships. You demonstrate Christ's love. You show them Jesus. That lies at the heart of this thing. It's the identity in Jesus that is, will save them. You don't come to Jesus after you've dealt with your gender dysphoria. You don't come to Jesus after you've dealt with your pornography problem. You don't come to Jesus after you've dealt with your sin problem. You come to Jesus. He renews you, and then you start dealing with these things. Persistent gender dysphoria? Yes? Happy? Right, boy. Now it starts getting a little bit closer to home, and this is what you guys, my parents, one of the reasons that we had come to this thing today. Transient gender dysphoria. Bruce Jenner would have been struggling with dysphoria when he was a little kid. So there are children that present to psychiatrists, to the medical fraternity, because the children are having such dysphoria around their sexuality that they go to seek help. So it's not just somebody, you know, my little boys, when my wife's getting dressed, they run through, find her shoes, and then go laughing down in mom's shoes. Look how funny it is. It's not gender dysphoria. These are people that are struggling with it to the point where it presents into medical, seeking for medical care. Out of these children that come, the majority will not persist with their gender dysphoria after adolescence. Once they go through puberty, the gender dysphoria resolves. That seems to be the norm from all of these studies over here. Every one of them shows the same thing. How many of them will desist? Desist means to stop. Persist means to continue. 65 to 85% of them will desist. So if you've got 10, six and a half children to eight and a half children, looks a bit weird to have a half children. But they say six to eight of them will no longer have gender dysphoria at the end of their, uh, by the end of their adolescence. There's no means to predict which ones will persist or desist. Now, it's interesting to read the literature around it and find um, world leaders in this saying, our team looked at this individual and everybody was convinced this person would be a persister and they desisted. We don't know. We can't identify. So out of these 10, one of those people will be Bruce Jenner or two of them will be Bruce Jenner who will continue with the dysphoria until they are 30, 40, 50. But six to eight of them will not persist. In this population of kids, there's high incidences of autism. They've got a very rigid understanding of the way the world works, very rigid categories of what is, what is or what is not. So if you're a woman, you must have long hair. If you don't have long hair, you can't be a woman. Sort of that type of way of thinking about it. Also high incidence of homosexual attractions, same-sex attractions in that population. 
I don't fit into with all of everybody else because I feel different about the people around me. I'm not happy with who I am. I don't know who I am. Driving this presentation. This is the Dutch writing about persisting and desisting gender dysphoria. Before the age of 10, we suggest a cautious attitude to transitioning. Before the age of 10, some girls who were almost but not entirely living as boys in the childhood years experienced great trouble when they wanted to return to the female gender role. We believe that parents and caregivers should fully realize the unpredictability of the child's psychosexual outcomes. They don't know what's going to happen. Be careful. Do I transition these kids now? Because remember the evidence maybe it didn't work when we just transitioned them late. We need to transition them earlier because they might do better. So let's transition the children with gender dysphoria. Let's start them on the, let's transition them socially. So you start cross-dressing them and presenting them as a girl or a boy to the population. Start them on hormone blockers early. Start them on cross-sex hormones early. Have surgery. Let's get them to look female or male early so they can transition. There's a major concern with this. What is the implications psychosexually, physically, emotionally on these children if you do that? What's fascinating is that once you take a child with gender dysphoria and you start to socially transition them, 100% of them become persisters. So out of the 10, you take the 6 or 8, you start treating them like somebody of the opposite sex. Their identity is malleable because they're so young and they will all persist, 100% of them. So you're turning desisters into persisters. There's been a big concern about this recently in, the, in Europe because children who have been persisted, who have been transitioned, have started to sue the government or raise concerns about it. What did you do to me? I'm 21 and I'm infertile and, you know, what happened? How could you do this to me? So the Swedish uh, Health Technology Agency, the UK NICE guidelines, the Cochrane reviews have assessed the evidence base for this, both in persistent gender dysphoria and in transient gender dysphoria. The recommendations or the summary is these studies are weak. They're uncontrolled observational studies. There's insufficient evidence to determine efficacy or safety. Very low uncertainty quality studies and we don't know what the long-term side effects are. What happens to a biological male who takes 40 years of estrogen? DVT risks, cancer risks. What happens to a woman that's taking testosterone for that period of time? Without, after two years on a puberty blocker, people become infertile. Once you start taking cross-sex hormones, just about 100% are infertile. Um, what happens to those that have surgery? infections, nerve damage, particularly when you're having mastectomies. This happening at the age of 15, 16, 17, 18. The Karolinska University says no longer be providing puberty blocking drugs or cross-sex hormones to children under the age of 16. Issues around consent. Can a 16-year-old really know what it means to give up their opportunity to have children? Like at 25, if you ask my wife and I, both professionals, do you want kids? We're like, we'll never want kids. At 35, both of us are busy trying to get I, you know, IVF. Now you're asking a 16-year-old. Concerns about the long-term effects of the drugs and hormones, questions about informed consent, they will only do this stuff in the context of a clinical trial. When you don't know what, what a treatment path is going to lead to, you must do it in a clinical trial. So that if it provides benefit, we can continue to do more of it. And if it causes harm, we can stop it early. This is the framework where some of the leading countries in Europe are sitting at at the moment. How should we respond? It seems to me that no matter what your political persuasion, uh, religious persuasion is, the number one rule is we need to protect children. It's also clear from the data that watching and waiting has a 60 to 80% success rate in those children that present with gender dysphoria. That doesn't mean you do nothing, because the child is a whole. There are other issues. There could be the autism. There could be family issues at play. There could be depression. There can be anxiety issues. The child needs to be treated as a whole, not just as some type of gender dysphoric individual. 
he is a whole, he's not just a diagnosis. If there is to be transition, and we live in an open society where people have the right to choose, I think it is the wrong thing to ban it. But if it is happening with children, then it needs to be in some type of registry, in some type of clinical research context, where we can see what's happening, because the whole of society has a stake in what's happening here. Transgender dysphoria. Got it. Caster Semenya, intersex DSD. Bruce Jenner, persistent gender dysphoria. Transient gender dysphoria. Last one. Rapid onset gender dysphoria. Or adolescent, on, on, adolescent onset gender dysphoria. This is what's being driven in the media. This is new. This is new like a new iPhone. It's happening in particularly young adolescent girls between 14 and 18. And it's happening in clusters. Never seen before. Clusters of friendships at schools, social clubs, or online. Three or four will come out as being transgender. Then there'll be a little rash of kids that also come out as uh, agender or pansexual or bisexual or homosexual in that grouping. There's these outbreaks of it. No prior history of gender dysphoria. Until six months ago, she was a happy girl doing her thing. Never said a word about it. All of a sudden, she's a gender dysphoric. It has the features of a fad or a craze. It seems to be sweeping through. It's a high social value action. I don't know if you, when you were going through your puberty, were particularly suave and good looking, you know, with my pimples and gangly, I can't even walk, you know, shoes, hands, feet, don't know, bumps, lumps. And now you're maybe slightly overweight, you're not very good at sports, and you're on the outskirts of what has been, you know, the cool kids, and you come out as trance. What happens to you in the community? You're at the top of the pile. You're being applauded at school, encouraged how brave social media, Instagram, Twitter, online people are saying how brave you are. This is a great thing that you're doing. You're finding your identity. It's a high social value action. It is underpinned or driven by an acceptance of this ideology that gender is fluid, that it is something that you can change, like a shirt. Because if it's a social construct, just change it. What's the issue? It is what you, it is what you, th you are what you think you are and is strongly linked with the woke social justice movement that's been sweeping through some of the schools. And I've seen it in multiple schools. They will have the Black Lives Matter movement, and in its wake, you have this coming up. Not 100%, but I've seen it significantly. It follows in a pattern. Children reject the need for dysphoria. This is gender dysphoria, but they say we don't need gender dysphoria. Because if gender is fluid, then I can choose to become fluid just because I want to. If you look at the sub-edits on Reddit, you know, these, these discussion sites, you can find it's labeled transmed, prerogative term to those who say, um, you must have dysphoria to transition. Who are you to tell me that I can't transition? And it's linked with aggressive activism, extremely aggressive activism. So again, the Dutch... We don't know whether studies we've done in the past can still be applied to this time. Many more children are registering and also a different type. Suddenly, there are many more girls applying who feel like a boy. While the ratio was the same in 2013, remember it was more men than women. In 2013, the same number of girls as boys. Now, three times as many children who are born as girls register compared to those born as boys. There's been a total shift in the demographic which means that the disease profile has changed. This is discussed very well, I think, in this book by Abigail Schreier. She's a, a, a left um, Democrat, not Christian at all, who is incensed by what's been happening with the children, with their girls. She calls it irreversible damage. One of the lines, she says, in the, in, in the heart of the, in, no, in the internet, there's an army of healers waiting to rip the heart out of your child. The number one rule online is, if you think you are trans, you are. So if you've got any doubts about your identity, anything to, you must be trans. The next thing is they'll tell you, your parents don't support you, you can only listen to us. Then they'll say, here's how to talk to doctors to make sure that you get into a transition program, and then as soon as you get the testosterone injection, your life will be better. There we are. 
So, intersex, persistent gender dysphoria, transient gender dysphoria, rapid onset gender dysphoria. Die goed is nie die selfde nie. These things are not the same. You cannot take data from DSD and apply it to a three, four-year-old who will detransition. It is illegitimate, it is irresponsible. You cannot take data, weak data, from persistent gender dysphoria and apply it to DSD or to rapid onset gender dysphoria. And while there might be some issues of overlap here, this thing is a totally new entity. It is again irresponsible, uh, intellectually uh, fraudulent in some ways, to take data and to say we can apply it to that. It's like doing research on mice and saying I can apply it directly to your daughter. It's not the same thing. When you think about it, when you talk about it, when you access these things, make sure that in your mind you're able to separate these out, understand that they are different. As I start wrapping up, I want to take this step back for a second. Your philosophy, the way that you see the world, underpins in many ways meaning and purpose in the world. And what you believe to be true, you act on. If you believe that cars travel on the left-hand side of the road, you will drive on the left-hand side of the road. You'll look left and right before you cross the road. And consistently doing things that we believe creates the society that we live in. The philosophy of transgenderism, so I'm not talking about the medical side, I'm talking about the philosophy of this, the belief system, is that gender is completely and utterly socially constructed. We're playing word games. They're based on power plays. Sex is totally decoupled from biology. It is irrelevant. If I say I think I am a cat, then I'm a cat. Get a few smiles. You know, I'm not so cat-like. I think I'm a dog. It must mean I'm a dog. But if I think I'm fat, does it mean I'm fat? This is the core problem in anorexia. It's a disconnect between what I believe or think or feel and what is true in reality. One of the highest mortality rates in psychiatry. Is it loving to say that she is fat? If you can be transgender, if I can change my gender, why can't I change my race? This is Rachel Dolazar, born as a Caucasian woman in America, presented herself as African-American because that's what she identified as, ran an African-American organize, help organization, was outed, vilified in the media, how dare she do that? But why? If you can be transgender, why not trans species? This guy presents as Boomer, identifies as Boomer the dog. He dresses in this outfit at home, drinks from a bowl, eats from a bowl, runs around in box. What about as a cat? What about as a mythical creature, a dragon? Because if you are what you think you are, then what's the issue? So philosophical transgenderism says, because I think I am a girl, I am a girl. And if you tell me that I'm not a girl, you are hateful, you are non-affirming, you are transphobic, you need to be shut down. You're attacking my very being, my very purpose. If I say I am a boy, I am a boy. I must be allowed access to where boys go. If you say no, you are hateful. You are transphobic. You're seeking to destroy me. You're racist. You're oppressive. I'm a boy. That's the philosophy that underpins this. Yeah. That's a lot. Real truth is to reflect reality. And that truth is found in Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And true love is setting your will to consistently seek the true good of the other. And God did that for us by sending Jesus. For God so set his will to seek our true good that he gave his only son, the ultimate expression of love. So our true identity in our nature as human 
But in this new creation, in Jesus, we are a new creation. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's a new thing. The old is gone, the new has come. Our true identity in Jesus Christ, I love this passage, is God sent him, Jesus, to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. It's to my heart with our kids who are adopted. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, promising, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. You are no longer a slave, but you are a child of God. That is the core of our identity. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ray. This is um, really insightful. It's really helpful to not confuse the issues. You have two boys. They're still very young. I want to ask you, uh, we'll have panel discussions later, but I just want to ask you just to land this for us. Um, what's your oldest boy's name? Joshua. If Joshua comes to you, uh, he's six now. If he comes to you in three years and he says, listen, uh, Dad, I don't know. I feel, I feel like a woman. I feel as though uh, I want to be with my girlfriends. And uh, what would your advice be to him? I'm going to ask a follow-up question, or maybe I should ask it now. Or maybe he comes to you and he says, Dad, I've got this friend at school. And uh, the friend is listening to Aerosmith the whole time, and he feels like a woman, you know? He feels like a lady. And uh, what, what, how should I treat him in school? So those two issues. He comes to you or he comes to you because his friend has an issue. Eris Smith says, man, I feel like a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we are doing preparation for this already with my sons. So we talk about what, a, what is a boy, what is a girl. So like, you know, when we're getting dressed, you know, the kids... If you've got kids, you know, sort of from about three to seven, it's just penises and bums and farts and you name it. And look, <laughs> you know, and they're getting changed and they want to know. And so I talk about it. What is a man? So the first thing is I teach them God made us like this. And then this is what a man is, what a man looks like, what a woman looks like. Then we talk about what is a man. I'm a man. I understand what it is. So in our house, we talk about a man being a servant a slave, follows Jesus. And we choose to follow Jesus. So that's a theme that we talk about all the time. Then, I got this from Simon Brace. I said to him, oh, you, see our, you see that cat there? And I point to our two large Great Danes. And they're like, what, Dad? No, that's Rufus. That's the dog's name. No, that's a cat. Can I think... Well, I'm trying to get them. They say, no, I man, that's a dog, Dad. That's a dog. Can, the, can a cat become a dog? So we're talking about these issues about identity. What is a thing? Can a thing change? We also talk about that God made us like this, that there's a purpose behind being a man and being behind a woman. This is, we also talk in our family about marriage. Can a man and a man marry? No, they can't. They can have a civil union. In law, they can have a civil union. They even if the, the law changed, they cannot marry. Marriage is a thing between a man and a woman by God recognized in law. So we talk about the issue. Now, he comes to me and starts saying he feels like a girl. One of the things to do there is just watch out for what has triggered this. Where is it coming from? What about abuse? Is he being exposed to something, school pornography? Is there a child that's driving this behind it? Because that is often one of the big causes, the thing that you need to be sensitive to. And you'll see my kid come, has started coming home with, with these, you know, Dad, what does sexing mean? And dancing in a slightly provocative manner. I'm like, and I know, I now know that there's one boy in particular that's going through some serious issues at home. That is the source of all of this coming through. So first question is, what's sitting behind it? The second question then is to try and see, does, you know, is there something 
at is the core in him that's driving this. And the approach that I would take in that is, is to continue to model what it means to be a man in, through myself. Spending time with reinforcing it. And studies show that if you take a child's sexuality is malleable. It's why if you take it and you dress them like a girl, they will start to think that they are a girl. So if you continue to support him and take him along the path of this is what a boy is, they will continue in that. Just be careful that you don't fall into the trap of support the bulls and bry and play rugby that you're not a man. That is what the gender... <laughs> the lights came on while I was speaking. That is, the, that is part of the lie that the gender, um, transgender movement presents. Look at Bruce Jenner's transition to a woman. It is a caricature of a woman. He's 45, 50. My mom does not look like that. That's a pinup doll. Real women like, look like the real women that are over here. So we be careful not to push him into a caricature of this must be a boy. There are boys that have a more effeminate expression. There is room in Christ to have a wide variation. You can be a tom girl and still be a girl because it's a biological thing. So allowing, and children are often very rigid in how they understand that as well. A little bit like the Osberg, uh, the uh, autism side of things. They struggle to break this. If you wear this, then I am the other thing. So giving them the grace and the space in which to do it, to continue to model it, and bring it down to Jesus. Remember, behavior can be copied. I, I can get him to do something, but I can't change his heart. Only Jesus can change the heart. The second issue is your question about what do I do with this person that's transitioning? Your child will be exposed to pornography at the age of seven or eight. If you do not talk, maybe earlier we're going to hear, if you don't talk and engage with the child before that, you lose the narrative, you lose the ground. Unfortunately, particularly now in the Western Cape, you need to have that conversation about gender and stuff before it happens so that you can have the discussion. And you need to be reiterating these foundational concepts. You need to be explaining why some people are confused around this thing and in basic ways that is accessible to the person. And then you need to teach the child to love those that differ because they they are an extension of your family, and that family is called to love them through Jesus. Is it easy? Do you have all the answers for it? No, I don't know. But I do know that as Christian communities, we've come through a whole lot more in the past. I mean, the troubles that we have now are nothing. Also know that God is in control. Trust Him that an identity in Jesus Christ is secure. So like we're trying to equip ourselves now, I think we do that. We take and learn from one another, and then we go forward and we see what works. Sarah.